Thank you so much. The incarnational stream speaks to us of how we make present and visible the realm of the invisible spirit and all oh, how we need this stream of life and faith today. This sacramental way of living speaks powerfully to the crying need today to experience God as truly manifest and notoriously active in daily life. Outside of Jesus himself, no one illustrates the incarnational stream better than Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, who carried the incarnate Son in her womb. Mary, who spoke those astonishing words of obedience to the angel's even more astonishing announcement of virgin birth. Mary, who spoke that revolutionary war cry in her Magnificat. Mary, who taught Jesus in the years of his obedience. Mary, who learned from Jesus in the years of his ministry. Mary, who pondered in her heart the incredible events of this singularly incredible life. Mary, who remained steadfast at the foot of the cross, watching her own son die. Mary, who stood as a solitary figure, watching the stone roll over the cave-style grave of her son's body, comforted only by the presence of Mary Magdalene. Mary, who remained with that faithful band in the upper room, constantly devoting themselves to prayer and waiting, waiting, waiting for power from on high. Mary, who quietly disappears from the pages of Scripture as her public work ends. We are left to wonder about the remaining days of her life. We wonder, but our wondering speculations are not answered. For us, it is enough to know that she lived obediently, faithfully. I would like to give special attention to two sides of Mary. Mary as obedient servant and Mary as revolutionary subversive. The classic expression of Mary as obedient servant is captured in her reply to the angel Gabriel. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. This response is so very astonishing. She had just been told that she was to be mother of of Messiah. And more than that, she had been told that the process involved would circumvent the natural laws of nature. She would remain a virgin. She would know no man. And still she would have a child, the Messiah child. What news, what astonishing news, what unbelievable news. Certainly, a hundred objections, a thousand questions must have been swirling in Mary's head. But her response is clear and firm. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. We would search long and hard to find a better example of obedience in all the Bible. Doesn't Mary's Response, speak to our condition. We who want to be in charge of our own destiny. We who long for absolute personal autonomy. We who never want to submit to anything or anybody. Maybe it's time for us to lay down the burden of always needing to get our own way. Perhaps now is the time we learn to say with Mary, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now in the midst of the exciting, perplexing, messianic news to Mary, the angel throws in a second shocker. Elizabeth. Yes, what about old Aunt Elizabeth? Elizabeth herself is six months pregnant, for nothing will be impossible with God. Elizabeth and Mary. One is old and has no children. 
The other is young and has no husband, but both are pregnant. So Mary rushes off to see her aunt Elizabeth. And the moment they greet, the child in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. What great, good, overwhelming news for the both of them. And it is here that we see Mary in her role as revolutionary subversive. She speaks forth what we have come to call Mary's Magnificat. And it is magnificent devotional piece, and it wonderfully magnifies the Lord God, the Almighty. But it is also a revolutionary war cry. For the most part, our context for Mary's Magnificat is Christmas cards and cantatas, and those are all well and good. But let me give you a new context with which to think of Mary's Magnificat. At the height of the Vietnam War protests, I gathered for a week with a group of Quakers called the Young Friends of North America. And for the first time in our history, really, our Quaker Christian peace testimony had gotten some traction in the popular culture, even if in a rather mutilated form. And I remember well our sitting together and singing with renewed vigor, the, you know, the old spiritual down by the riverside with its refrain, I ain't going to study war no more. And to the standard verse, going to lay down my sword and shield, we would make up all kinds of other verses. Going to lay down my titan missile, down by the riverside. Going to lay down my sidewinder, down by the riverside. Going to lay down my AGMs, down by this riverside. Ain't I going to study war no more. And then passion would begin to build, see. And we would pick up on a song about George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, who wore leather pants and had long hair. I liked him for that. And with gusto, we would sing that final line of the song, in your old leather breeches and your shaggy, shaggy locks, you are pulling down the kingdoms of this world, George Fox. <laughs> now, that would give you a little sense of the feeling that must have surrounded that astonishing poem we call Mary's Magnificat. Mary is here proclaiming that a new day is coming, a new order is coming, a day and an order of justice for the poor. Herod the Great and Caesar Augustus be forewarned, for Mary declares that God is bringing down rulers from their thrones and lifting up the humble. God is filling the hungry with good things and is sending the rich away empty. So Mary's song undercuts and subverts the unjust rule of Herod the Great and Caesar Augustus. It was and is a revolutionary war cry. Listen to these words of Mary, words that are lovely and radical, both at the same time. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Revolutionary words, to be sure. But of course, this messianic event was more revolutionary than even Mary understood. The Messiah would indeed come and would indeed overcome but not in the way that Mary and all the others expected. Jesus did usher in a new kingdom, but not by wearing Herod's crown. Messiah's revolution came by suffering and by dying. It was a conquest, all right, but it was a conquest that came by suffering. It was war, all right, but it was and is the peaceable war of the Lamb of God. Conquest by suffering. Mary, 
obedient servant. Mary, revolutionary subversive, a glowing example of the incarnational stream. Mary, of course, has rightly become the most famous of women. Most of us, however, will live out an incarnational life in relative obscurity. And so I want to introduce you to just such a person, Lilius Trotter. Lilius lived in the late 19th century, early 20th century. She was an artist, an almost famous artist, more on that later. She was a poet and a writer and a pioneer missionary to the Muslim peoples of Algeria. Lilius Trotter was born into a life of 19th century British prestige and privilege. Her father was a stockbroker for one of the most important firms on the London Stock Exchange. Her home was a choice mansion on London's fashionable West End, complete with a staff of servants. Lilius's mother was knowledgeable in the historic and contemporary fields of art, literature, and religion. And her father had a keen, curious mind who took a genuine interest in everyone and everything. Once on a trip to America, he talked with slave and free alike. And while observing Niagara Falls in the moonlight, he called his wife saying, Come this minute, I do not believe you have yet seen Niagara Falls. Lilius's religious education was rooted in the rites and rituals of the Church of England and further enlivened by the renewal work of the great Keswick movement, which was at its height at this time. A spiritual clinic for the soul was the way Keswick was often described. And I've been to Keswick, England myself, where this movement began, and I'm always touched by the great good that came from such an unassuming place. At Keswick, Lilius attended daily Bible readings, listened to scholarly expositions on life and faith, and heard testimonies of former black slaves from the United States reflecting upon their faith while in slavery. The net effect of Keswick was to stir and stretch Lilius's soul. Years later, she would write, we ourselves are saved to save. We are made to give, to let everything go, if only we may have more to give. Lilius would return to London from Keswick, inspired to live out her faith with new vitality and intimacy with Jesus. She began leading Bible studies for the array of Florence Nightingale nurses traveling to and from the Crimean War. She became a volunteer during Dwight L. Moody's London Evangelistic Crusades, and she began to donate her time to the Welbeck Institute, an organization dedicated to helping young women, single women of inner city London. At about this time, her gift for painting was discovered by John Ruskin, a well-known art critic and social philosopher. They met in Venice, Italy. He, a towering figure throughout Victorian England, 57 years old, she an impressionable 23-year-old. Looking at the portfolio of Lilius's watercolors, Ruskin instantly saw what a rare artistic talent she was. Sir Kenneth Clark in his biography, Ruskin Today, says that the great man was in ecstasy over her drawings. He became convinced that if her talent could be cultivated, that he could make her one of England's greatest living artists. He voluntarily set aside the time to educate and mentor her. Over several years, he worked with her on technique, uh, uh, taught her to love color, and encouraged her attention to detail. They critiqued the famous works of art, visited museums, and reviewed the newest artists on the European scene. In spite of his own busy schedule, Ruskin poured hour upon hour into training and tutoring Lilius. During one of her visits to Ruskin's home, he envisioned a future in which she would be the greatest painter of her age if only she would devote herself entirely to her art. He laid at Lilius' feet his own extraordinary resources to develop her talent 
and promote her career. Dazzled by all this interest, Lilius wrote to a friend that Ruskin felt she would be the greatest living painter and would do things that would be immortal. In short, Ruskin was offering her the possibility that even after she was gone, people would remember her name through the magnificent paintings she created. With his talent as a teacher and his power as a cultural leader, he could launch her career single-handedly. He had done so with Dante Gabriel Rossetti and others. He could do the same for her. But with the offer came a caveat. To become immortal, she would have to give herself up entirely to art. The opportunity shook Lilius to the core. She writes about that experience, saying, At first I could only rush about in the woods all in a dream for the first day or two. Since then, an almost constant state of suffocation, half intoxication, so that I could hardly eat or sleep. After days of agonizing deliberation, she saw clearly that to devote herself to art in the way that Ruskin intended would mean that she would have to abandon her ministry work. And this she would not, could not do. She wrote, I see clear as daylight now, I cannot give myself to painting in the way he means. And so her answer to Ruskin was no. Friends and family were shocked and disappointed by her decision. No one knew better than Lilius how her renunciation of Ruskin's offer would affect her life. Many years later, a lifelong friend recounted the ache of desire that was with her to the end, especially on the days when she took up her brush, conscious of the pain of the artist who takes up an unpracticed tool and knows full well to what beauty he might bend it if he could only give to it his strength and life. In spite of her refusal, their friendship continued through the years. Lilius continued to paint, and Ruskin continued to tempt her toward a career in art. In 1886, Ruskin wrote to the Duchess of Albany and included a picture by, quote, my best of pupils, Lilius Trotter. But the die had been cast. Soon afterward, Lilius entered her life work. Attending a three-day mission conference, she heard about the need in North Africa, especially Algeria. At that meeting, Lilius heard the call to serve God as a pioneer missionary. Here was a wealthy British woman giving up a comfortable life as an artist and socialite to become a pioneer missionary to the Muslim people of Algeria. She first applied to be a missionary candidate for the North Africa mission, and she was turned down. She had a weak heart all of her life, and probably that was why they turned her down. And so she formed her own mission effort, the Algiers Mission Ban. Less than nine months later, she and two other women left water, London's Waterloo Station on the first leg of their journey to Algeria. Upon their arrival, Lilius wrote in her journal, I shall never forget the loveliness of our first sight out of our porthole of the Arab town rising tier above tier in the glow of cream color against the blue, gray, western sky the water glimmering in blue and gold below, and a flock of gulls sailing and wheeling between us and the land. The moment Lilius and her companions learned enough Arabic to converse with people, they started establishing relationships. Their first contacts were with children that they met in the streets. They found that the children were the keys that unlocked the doors to the women of Algeria. These women were not allowed on the streets, but were hidden away behind jail-like walls of their North African homes. Soon, through the children, 
Lilius was invited into the women's homes and began developing friendships and participating in the ordinary tasks of daily life. As relationships developed, Lilius formed Bible study groups. These Muslim women called her Lily, and they would often remark, Lily loves us. When more people joined Lilius in her missionary outreach, she began to develop outposts in the rural inland areas of Algeria. See, her passion was always to go to the unreached interior. She traveled by any method available, horse-drawn carts, donkeys, mules, camels, even on foot, often going hundreds of miles across the bone-dry deserts of North Africa with few supplies. But Lilius did not seem to notice the treacherous desert. What she did notice was the beauty all around her. She writes, Oh, the desert is lovely in its restfulness, the great brooding stillness over and through everything is so full of God. Later in life, Lilius wrote, To think that God brought me to such a place of beauty. In addition to being a gifted painter, Lilius was a gifted writer. She developed numerous evangelistic booklets adorned with watercolor pictures depicting Algeria. Indeed, all of her writings, journals, books, pamphlets, they're illustrated with these lovely watercolors and line drawings. Lilius Trotter's books and pamphlets and journal writings are all now out of print but I want to make a few comments about one of them. Lilius wrote a little booklet entitled Focused, and it inspired a well-known hymn, or song at least, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let me read to you just a few lines from this tiny little booklet. It was in a little wood in early morning the sun was climbing behind a steep cliff in the east, and its light was pouring nearer and nearer, and then making pools among the trees. Suddenly, from a dark corner of purple brown stems and tawny moss, there shone out a great golden star. It was just a dandelion and half withered, but it was full faced to the sun and had caught into its heart all the glory it could hold, and was shining so radiantly that the dew that lay on it still made a perfect aureole around its head. It seemed to talk standing there, to talk about the possibility of making the very best of these lives of ours. For if the sun of righteousness has risen upon our hearts, there is an ocean of grace and love and power lying all around us, an ocean to which all earthly light is but a drop, and it is ready to transfigure us as the sunlight transfigured the dandelion, and on the same condition that we stand full face to God. Turn full your soul's vision to Jesus, and look and look at him and a strange dimness will come over all that is apart from him. And the divine attribute by which God's saints are made, even in this 20th century, will lay hold of you. For he is worthy to have all there is to be had in the heart that he has died to win. Well, reading that little, this little booklet, a Brit by the name of Helen Howarth Limmel penned those well-known words, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Why don't we do just that? Let's take a moment. Simply turn our eyes. To he who is lovely, Jesus, Savior, 
teacher, Lord, friend. Oh Lord, may we look more and more full face into your goodness and glory, we pray. Amen. Now, all of these streams of faith that we have been discussing in this series, contemplative, holiness, charismatic, social justice, evangelical, incarnational, are flowing together into a mighty movement of the Spirit. They constitute a new gathering of the people of God in our day. I see it happening this great new gathering of the people of God, I see an obedient, disciplined, freely gathered people who know in our day the life and powers of the kingdom of God. I see a people of cross and crown, of courageous action and sacrificial love. I see a people who are combining evangelism with social action, the transcendent lordship of Jesus with the suffering servant Messiah. I see a people who are buoyed up by the vision of Christ's everlasting rule, not only imminent on the horizon, but already bursting forth in our midst. I see a people, I tell you, I see a people, even though it feels like I am peering through a glass darkly. I see a country pastor from Indiana embracing an urban priest from New Jersey and together praying for the peace of the world. I see a people. I see a Catholic monk from the mountains of Colorado standing alongside a Baptist evangelist from the streets of Los Angeles and together offering up a sacrifice of praise. I see a people. I see social activists from the urban centers of Hong Kong joining with Pentecostal preachers from the barrios of Sao Paulo and together weeping over the spiritually lost and the plight of the poor. I see a people. I see laborers from Soweto and landowners from Pretoria honoring and serving each other out of reverence for Christ. I see a people. I see Hutu and Tutsi, Serb and Croat, Mongol and Han Chinese, African American and Anglo, Latino and Native American, all sharing and caring and loving one another. I see a people. I see the sophisticated standing with the simple, the elite standing with the dispossessed, the wealthy standing with the poor. I see a people, I see a people, I tell you, a people from every race and nation and tongue and strata of society joining hearts and hands and voices declaring amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Dallas, whatever our theology is to be, it needs to be experiential, I think. And um, when I was discussing the incarnational stream, I used Mary as a biblical paradigm and Mary's response mm -hmm. to the angel Gabriel, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Now, would you think it would be heretical if, if a, a believing Christian a follower after Jesus would try to share in a way Mary's experience and ask for maybe a, you know, almost a sense of a personal incarnation. Uh, may your son be formed in me today, something like that. Would that? Well, it would be heretical not to do that. <laughs> That's the, her that's the heresy. Let's, <laughs> let's get the otherness where it belongs. Uh, Mary, of course, was expressing not a new thing, but an old thing. Mm. Because if you look back through the Old Testament and you sense the, the place of Israel in God's plans, mm. that's the attitude. Mm. Now, Mary was, of course, speaking of something very specific, which no one right. else is a part of. Right. But still... Incarnation is not just about Jesus and Mary. Right. It is about God dwelling 
in human beings. Yes. And so the church is really the continuing incarnation of Christ. Mm. And that's why Paul rightly calls it his body. Mm. Now, what does that mean? See, and here the, the challenge is for us to get it out of the realm of mere doctrine, mm -hmm. mere ecclesiology, mm -hmm. and translate it into life. And of course, that's where um, that phrase, with God, mm. which you know is so important and in, in, your, in the Renovari Study Bible is so right. prominent. Right. Because that's really what it's all about. And yeah. you know, most people can have their lives changed just by taking a good concordance and reading the with God passages in the, <laughs> in the Bible. Because that's really what life in the kingdom of God means. It means to be united with God in his action. Yeah. Eternal life means to be caught up in the life that Jesus is now leading on earth mm. because he really is in charge of things now. Mm. He is mm. king of the kings. Yeah, yeah. And uh, many of the kings don't know who they're working for. They'll find out later, no doubt, but uh, they're working for him. Wow. And now we in our individual life want to have that attitude. And so as we go to work or as we uh, drive or whatever it is we're doing, we want that phrase, let it be to me according to your word. Mm. to be the constant theme. Yes, yeah. And that's, that might be a good phrase to substitute, say, for the Jesus prayer in some mm. disciplinary. Instead of using that prayer, perhaps substitute, let it be to me according to your word. Can you share with us a person that uh, you know of that seems to fully and joyfully exude that kind of incarnation of well, Christ? Well, I have to choose one that is known well only in heaven, and that is my maternal my paternal grandmother, mm -hmm. Susan Rhoda Willard. Mm -hmm. uh, she was uh, a woman that uh, I lived with my grandparents when I was in high school. And uh, it is tr a truth to say that she knew the secret of this and lived mm -hmm. it. And everyone in the countryside knew it. Really? And mm -hmm. would come to her for prayer and ministry because of that. But. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I saw most of it was how she put up with an honorary grandchild that had lacked good sense yeah. ever since he'd been born right. <laughs> and right, continued right. to pray for me and love me and direct me. And never, I never saw her act out of anger. Hmm. Never. Wow. And she was a woman who, in the First World War, her oldest son, my father, was in France. Her husband, a Methodist minister, was on the circuit. Yeah. Uh, she basically had to find food uh, where she could, and she had sure. a garden and an orchard and raised right. things. And right. they, but the spirit of this, and she knew mm. the power of the surrendered life. Wow! And it affected everything she did. Mm. Now, isn't this what we mean when we speak of spiritual formation? That's it. That's the outcome. See, the outcome is that easy resting and acting with God that Jesus talked about mm. that comes in the easy yoke. Mm. And so we, we wear that, we take that yoke in everything that we do. Mm. We, this is like being filled with the Spirit. Uh, all of these things come together, of course, in actual life. Mm. Uh, we abstract and talk <laughs> about them separately, but mm. they really are one life. Mm. And, uh, and that, that just means that we learn to walk in the yoke with Jesus everywhere.